When you see a patient with hypertension, do you ever wonder what the ideal blood pressure target would be? Would it be less than 140 systolic or perhaps less than 120 systolic? I chose this topic because I felt like during our time in medical school, the blood pressure management guidelines were changing very rapidly, so I thought it'd be a good review to take a look at intensive versus standard blood pressure control in non-diabetic patients. I will mainly be looking at the landmark 2015 SPRINT trial. But first, a background. In 2003, we got the JNC7 guidelines, which provided a criteria for diagnosing hypertension, as well as a recommendation to treat blood pressure to less than 140 over 90, or less than 130 over 80 in patients with diabetes or CKD. And these recommendations were based off of some seminal studies done in the 70s and 80s. Now, this was generally accepted for many years until in 2010, there were a couple of landmark trials which argued against tighter blood pressure goals. One of these that you should be very familiar with is the ACCORD blood pressure trial, which was conducted in 2010, and saw that in diabetic patients, target blood pressure less than 120 did not reduce cardiovascular events compared to target blood pressure less than 140. As well, the patients in the lower blood pressure group experienced more severe adverse events. In the SBS3 blood pressure trial, stroke patients were examined and found that target blood pressure less than 130 did not reduce the chance for a future stroke compared to target blood pressure less than 150. With these results, the JNC7 decided to update their guidelines in 2014 to JNC8. And what they basically did here was they made the blood pressure targets a little bit more lenient. So now all patients have a goal blood pressure of less than 140 over 90, including diabetes or CKD patients. And in elderly patients, the goal blood pressure was actually less than 150 over 90, which was done, again, by some recent studies, which showed no benefit to treating these elderly patients below a blood pressure of 140. But what about in patients without a history of stroke or diabetes? Should we really be applying these trials, which were conducted in stroke or diabetic patients, to the entire general population? So this is where the SPRINT trial comes in, or the Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial. It was funded and sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, as well as several of the sub-organizations within the NIH. There was a small donation by Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they provided azosartan for patients on that medication. The study noted that less than 5% of patients were on this medication, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals had no other role in the study. Now, taking a look at the inclusion criteria, patients were recruited from 2010 to 2013, and were eligible if they were aged greater than or equal to 50, with a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 180, and a cardiovascular disease risk factor, whether that was a prior MI, a PCI, a cabbage, uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, CKD, age greater than 75, or a calculated risk score of greater than 15%. Now, there were 14,692 patients in total. 9,300 of them underwent randomization, while 5,300 were excluded. Again, the major exclusion factors were diabetes or stroke, but also, in general, any life-limiting illness that could skew the results of the test or a history of poor adherence to medications. And the patients who underwent randomization were separated equally into an intensive treatment group with a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and a standard treatment group with a target systolic blood pressure of less than 140. Now looking at the study design, this was a five-year study and patients were seen monthly for the first three months and then every three months afterwards to make sure they were hitting their blood pressure target and their medications adjusted accordingly. Interestingly, this study was actually stopped early in 2015 when the intensive treatment group showed significant superiority compared to the standard treatment group. The median follow-up was 3.26 years. Looking at the baseline characteristics of the patients, you can see that after randomization, the patients in both groups were fairly similar in almost all regards, including age, percent with chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, number of females, the average age was 68, and the racial distribution was also very similar. The baseline blood pressure among both groups was very similar at around 140 systolic and 78 diastolic. And looking at smoking status, 
the distribution of smokers and non-smokers was also very similar. The researchers then looked to see if their standard versus intensive treatment groups actually hit the goals they were intending to. And on the left, you can see systolic blood pressure here. You can see the standard blood pressure groups. They had a mean blood pressure of 136 at one year. And the intensive treatment group had a mean blood pressure of 121 at one year. Next, the study decided to look at their primary outcomes. The first primary outcome was a composite cardiovascular outcome, including the first occurrence of an MI, ACS, stroke, heart failure, or death from a cardiovascular cause. Now, in the intensive treatment group, 243 patients, or 5.2%, reached this primary outcome, while in the standard treatment group, 319 patients reached it, or 6.8% of patients. This represents a hazard ratio of 0.75 with a p-value of less than 0 0.001 and the number needed to treat was 62. Next, they looked at a renal outcome and looked at patients with baseline CKD and those without baseline CKD. And in patients with baseline CKD, they looked to see if the patients had a 50% reduction in GFR and there was no difference between the intensive treatment and standard treatment group. In patients without baseline CKD, they looked to see if patients had a 30% reduction in GFR and found that there actually was a significant difference and more patients in the intensive treatment group had uh, a greater than 30% decline in their GFR. This was a hazard ratio of 3.49 with a very significant p-value and a number needed to harm of 37. This is just a graphical depiction of the primary outcome. As you can see, the intensive treatment group had much better cardiovascular outcomes compared to the standard treatment group. And looking at death from any cause, the intensive treatment group was also significantly lower than the standard treatment group, a hazard ratio of 0.73 with a confidence interval of 0.6 to 0.9. The study then examined to see if there are any subgroups within their study that showed any significant differences, and they found that there were no significant differences between the subgroups in their study. Now we're looking at a table of the adverse events in the study, and this is definitely a very important graph to take a look at because we, of course, expect more medication-related adverse events in the intensive treatment group. And I've highlighted here the significant increased adverse events in these patients, including hypotension, syncope, electrolyte abnormality, AKI, as well as some lab abnormalities. Of note, however, the authors noted that there was no increase in injurious falls compared to the standard treatment group. And paradoxically, orthostatic hypotension was actually significantly lower in the intensive treatment group compared to the standard treatment group. Overall, the number of serious adverse events possibly or definitely associated with the intervention was 4.7% in the intensive treatment group versus 2.5% in the standard treatment group. That's a hazard ratio of 1.88 and a number needed to harm of 45. Now let's move on to the discussion and the clinical recommendation after reviewing the SPRINT trial. So what are some of the pros of the SPRINT trial and intensive blood pressure therapy? The number one benefit to the intensive blood pressure treatment was that the cardiovascular outcome was significantly improved. There was a 25% decrease in the primary outcome, which was significant, 38% reduction in heart failure, 43% reduction in cardiovascular death, and 27% reduction in any death. And the number needed to treat, again, was 62 for the primary outcome. Additionally, they looked at the rates of stroke, and in the SPRINT trial, they found an 11% decreased risk of stroke, although not significant. And actually, if you look at the previous studies that I talked about before, in the SBSP3 trial, they found a 19% reduced risk of stroke, which was not significant, although the p-value was 0 0.08, so it was getting close to significance. And in the ACCORD blood pressure trial, there was a 41% reduced risk of stroke, which was significant. So the authors felt that their study corroborated this positive trend towards reduced stroke in patients treated with intensive blood pressure control. Finally, this study was a very large study with over 9,000 patients. They had a very diverse population, and so it is a very highly powered study and can be quite generalizable. 
What are some cons to this study? Well, of course, we mentioned the renal outcome, which showed that the number needed to harm was 37 in non-CKD patients. There was a 249% increase in the risk of GFR decreasing. Additionally, this trial actually ended early, so there is the possibility that they didn't catch some of the adverse renal out outcomes that would have showed up later. And in general, there has been concern for end-organ hypoperfusion in patients who are treated to a lower blood pressure target. And the SPRINT trial did not really do much to provide evidence against that. Furthermore, looking at the adverse events, the number needed to harm was 45. There was an 88% increase in serious adverse events, including syncope, hypotension, and AKI. As expected, the patients in the intensive therapy group had a higher pill burden, which we know is associated with poor outcomes in the elderly. And additionally, the blood pressure target was very difficult to reach. As I mentioned earlier, the mean blood pressure in the intensive therapy group was 121 systolic, so they weren't even able to get below 120 in many patients. Finally, the average age of the study participants was 68 years old, and there were no patients under 50 in the study, so while Yes, the large sample size and diverse population makes the study more generalizable. The fact that the cohort was more elderly and did not include patients under the age of 50 also somewhat limits the generalizability of the SPRINT trial. So what is my personal take on the SPRINT trial? Well, I have to say it's quite convincing. It's a very large, very powerful study and showed very significant decreases in mortality and improvements in cardiovascular outcomes. On the other hand, though, there was quite an increase in adverse events uh, related to the increase in blood pressure medications. Additionally, it seems like it would be a very hard and difficult struggle to constantly be trying to get your patients to a systolic blood pressure under 120. So I wondered, maybe is there a middle ground, perhaps a blood pressure target of less than 130 over 80? And what I found is that since SPRINT was conducted, many other studies and meta-analyses have been conducted as well. Almost all of them finding a benefit to treating a, to a target blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. Also, an additional thing that I didn't mention earlier is that in the SPRINT trial, all of the blood pressure measurements were taken with an automatic electronic blood pressure cuff which many experts think reads 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury less than the true blood pressure. So in reality, the patients in the SPRINT trial may have been reaching a target blood pressure of less than 130 rather than a target blood pressure of less than 120. So with all these new studies that have been developed, we've actually started to notice a change in the guidelines as well. So again, here is the JNC8, which we took a look at earlier. And in 2017, using the SPRINT trial as a major basis for these new guidelines, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association came out with some updated guidelines in 2017. First of all, instead of calling 120 to 140 systolic blood pressure and 80 to 90 diastolic prehypertension, their new diagnostic cutoff for hypertension was changed to 130 systolic. This represented the first change in blood pressure cutoffs for diagnosing hypertension in 14 years. And additionally, instead of these recommendations for goal blood pressure, they instead recommended a goal blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 in all patients. So what are the take-home points? I want you to remember the landmark Accord blood pressure study in 2010, which found that in diabetes patients, a systolic blood pressure target of less than 120 was not better than a target of less than 140 in terms of their cardiovascular outcomes. This led to an update of the JNC8 in 2014, which adjusted blood pressure goals to be more lenient in diabetic patients and the elderly. Now we have the all-important SPRINT trial, which we discussed today, which showed that intensive therapy to a systolic blood pressure target of less than 120 over 80 was superior in non-diabetic patients. And finally, we have the now new ACC AHA guidelines in 2017, which recommend all patients be treated to a blood pressure target of less than 130. As you can see, it is the combination of all of these studies and guidelines which have culminated to become our current established recommendation. 
And my personal clinical recommendation, based on what I've learned, is that we should set the blood pressure target to less than 130 over 80 for all patients, and we can consider a slightly more lenient blood pressure target in the elderly population. Here are some treatment algorithms from the JNC8 that I thought were helpful, as well as the ACC AHA 2017, which you can compare between each other to see how they differ uh, between these last three years. Here are my references, and thanks for watching.